My name is Sherry Pascarella. I am the executive director here on behalf of our amazing co-founders, April Gornick and Eric Fischel, and our board, some of whom are with us today, our full team, um, and our director circle. Welcome to those of you who are part of the director circle. We'd love to welcome every single one of you to the church this afternoon. If you have never, hey Alex, you're here. And don't be shy, I'm not, um, obviously. Thank you, for, thank you sincerely, everybody, to, for joining us on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, the church it opened its doors in April 2021 with the mission of fostering creativity on the East End and honoring the history of Sag Harbor as a maker's village, and it is quite a rich history at that. Um, Today's program is a part of the robust series around our current exhibition, Strike Fast, Dance Lightly, Artists Unboxing, co-curated by Eric Fischel and Sara Cochran. Um, a second iteration of the show is currently on view at the Flag Foundation in New York, curated by John Ryder and Caroline Cassidy. And if you haven't had the chance to see that yet, please do. It is open until August 11th. A third iteration of the show will bring together both units and expand upon it in an iteration curated by Arden Sherman at the Norton Museum in Palm Beach, opening in late winter 2024. So yeah, you can, that's also huge first for us. We're, uh, there will be an exhibition catalog as well. We're all tremendously excited about this and the Flag Foundation was of course founded by Glenn Furman. Um, more on that in a moment. So, if those of you who do travel to Miami regularly, please check us out. I know, sorry, I meant if you're going to Miami for our balls on Miami, make sure to make a detour to Palm Beach sometime between December 1st and 24th in 2024. So, um, delighted to rob you up there, here. Hi. I said to somebody, uh, Eric said, who's coming today? And I said, I don't, well, I know like everybody coming, so if I haven't met you before, hello. Um, enough about all of that. Let's talk about why we're here. I'm extremely delighted to introduce our two speakers, and I will keep this, the rest of this brief because they hardly need any introduction. Glenn Ligon is one of America's most important living, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this very brief statement that I'm about to make. Uh, America's most pa one of America's most important living artists, a career that spans over three decades of conceptual practice spanning painting, sculpture, printmaking, and beyond. For those of us who have followed this career, we are rewarded with deep lessons in art and art making, as well as essential understandings of life and the human condition relevant to our times to all times. Glenn's work from 1995 is included in the exhibition upstairs. I hope you checked it out. And he is joined today by Gunn Furman, a prominent investor, philanthropist, and art collector, many of you know through his Flag Art Foundation in New York City, which is a co-presenter, co-organizer of this exhibition. Thank you both sincerely for being here. Please clap for them because they deserve it. <laughs> The floor is yours. All right, well, thank you all for being here. It's great to see so many people. And it's great to just be a part of this incredible institution that has been just such a rich addition to the entire Hamptons, not just Sag Harbor. We have a home in Sagaponic, but it's really, really wonderful, wonderful to be here. So I'm really honored to be talking with Glenn Ligon here. Uh, we don't have a short period of time, but I'm gonna try to cover every single work over your three decade career. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see if we can hit that all. Um, but I thought we would start on Skin Tight, which is the work upstairs from 1995 uh, with the hanging punching bags. Can you maybe just talk back to you know, that period of time in 1995, what you were working on, how this piece really came to be, and you know, a little bit of some of the specifics, because it, it covers a lot of ground. Um, sure, but first I want to thank uh, Eric and April for creating this amazing space. 
Uh, I haven't been out this way in about 20 years, so um, I'm a non-driver, so Sag Harbor, <laughs> the Hamptons in general, is a problem for me. But um, this incredible space, an incredible uh, context to show the work in, um, and show the work in the context of a lot of my artistic peers, too, and some new names to me, too. So I was really pleased to see the range of the work that's being shown, the range of ages of the artists, uh, from very young, you know, to senior important artists, figures. Um, and let me say about the work initially, you know, I was talking to Eric uh, Fischel earlier about the idea of boxing and what a why so many artists have dealt with it as a theme in the work. And it is because it's a metaphor. It can contain so many ideas about masculinity, about race, about national identity. It, it is a full arena <laughs> uh, to explore those kinds of ideas in. And so when I was invited by the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia, it was run by the late beloved Kippy Stroud, uh, inviting artists to Philadelphia to do projects that were based in fabric. But what that meant was kind of up to you. And I'd done an earlier piece with the artist, a dear friend of mine, Byron Kim, that uh, was a punching bag that he had in his studio for many years. And we were trying to think of a collaborative work to make. And he was very fascinated by Muhammad Ali, as I was. Um, he said that when he was a child, uh, his uh, Byron's Korean and his parents said they admired Ali because they, Ali said things that they as immigrants could felt like they could not say. That Ali had figured out how to be an American and say what he thought mm. and embody his values and they aspired to that. Um, and so it's sort of interesting to me that like Ali was a figure that Byron was interested in, not only because he was an amazing boxer, but because he had this moral stance, because he had a kind of integrity, because he gave up you know, boxing to fight for his principles in some ways when he was suspended. Um, so we began thinking about Ali, and I remember there was a, a film by William Klein, the documentary filmmaker, uh, called The Greatest. And it is not a narrated documentary. It's just footage following Ali from his first fight with first fights with Sonny Liston through the um, Kinshasa fight. Um, and in that documentary, Ali is I don't even know remember what the question was, or it was at a press conference. And he's asked kind of, you know, like, why do you call yourself the greatest, you know? Why are you being so boastful, you know? And he's, you know, kind of in his alley way says, well, why can't I be the greatest? Why does everything that's white has to be the greatest? Like, white cloud soap, and Mary had a little lamb or fleece with white as snow, and white Jesus, and, you know, like, on and on and on. It's this amazing rant about how whiteness is held up as the thing that is the greatest, but somehow blackness can never be that. And so he's claiming his greatness in order to claim his greatness for black people in general. And I think there's always something about Ali's stance that he feels like his fate as an individual is always connected to the fate of the race in general. Me, we, to quote uh, a neon that is located uh, in the lobby of the Studio Museum in Harlem uh, when its new building will open, uh, and we'll be back there again. But that's coming from a Ali quote. And so always for Ali has a sense of that his fate as an individual is connected with the fate of black people in general. And so that rant in that film, I thought, oh, that's amazing. Why don't we, because I'm the text guy, and, and Byron had this punching bag, it's like, well, why don't our, why doesn't our collaboration be our discussions around Ali, but let's use that text and we'll just stencil around this old punching bag in your studio. You don't need it anymore, do you? Um, and so that's how that piece started. But then when I was invited to the fabric workshop, I realized like, oh, well, this is a venue where I can actually make punching bags. Like, and so they bought a punching bag for me. We deconstructed it, see what's inside of it, you know? 
uh, how it was constructed, and, and so that's how that piece came about. I mean, the, the Muhammad Ali, of course, almost anything with boxing, it always comes back to Muhammad Ali. You know, the Leon Spinks quote and choosing Leon Spinks, you know, there were a lot of fighters you could have chosen. What, what resonated with you about Leon Spinks and that particular quote? Mm, I'm not even remembering the quote It now. was like, you beat me, he, he beat me last, I, be, I beat him, then he beat me. It's as simple as that. Right. I'm right, paraphrasing. Right, right. Well, Leon Spinks, if anyone knows Richard Pryor's routines, he has a long thing about Leon Spinks and... <laughs> how Leon Spinks is, you know, he says something like, you know, Leon Spinks, fighter, he has nothing to lose, and he does his imitation of Leon Spinks. It's like, you know, I ain't got no money, I ain't got no teeth, tifus, he says tifus, and I certainly ain't got no driver's license because he was pulled over for, like, driving, so I have nothing to lose. And so, so Leon Spinks was... A kind of a joke in a way. Almost but like a comedic punching bag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in that way, but also quite serious that he was a, you know, legitimate contender for right. Ali for a minute. Until Ali is it. But um, <laughs> so that's kind of where that quote was. But I wanted also to think about, you know, boxing. As I said, boxing is a metaphor for other things. So I wanted to think about other ways in which boxing has entered the culture. So that's why one of the punching bags has Ice Cube's eyes on it in the, in the space of where like a logo on a punching bag would be because Ice Cube's eyes are very famous, you know? Ice Cube stare. This is pre like the movies um, when he was a rapper, um, not a rapper actor. Um, and but two, two but also, also kind of like the idea of also black male anger commodified, mm -hmm. too. And so, that's Tupac also, because there's a reference to Tupac in the piece. Well, too. the thug life, yeah. yeah, that it was, again, you know, a, a tattoo on Tupac that became in a way commodified in a certain kind of way and became corporate in a right. way it could be. And how boxing as a sport is you know commercial enterprise and made some people very rich um, and was used in various ways in the culture. So I was interested in all those kinds of things, the collision between boxing culture and music culture, uh, ideas about masculinity in there, uh, the thug life bag that's slumped in the corner because that is often the trajectory for boxers, you know. I mean, the masculinity the thing with, with boxing is so interesting because it's so much of a kind of ideal of this kind of raw masculinity, but there's like the homoerotic aspects of boxing can't be denied. I mean, it's like these grown men hugging each other half the fight, and you know, it, it, it's a very complex metaphor. Well, I think that's been explored in in some movies and plays. Uh, there's um, why am I not remembering? Somebody help me here. The play that's on Broadway that's about the, the opera. Sorry. Champion. Champion. Yeah, it's dealing with this question of like one, f one fighter is called a, a, a sort of slur about his masculinity. And, mm -hmm. and that becomes a sort of like thing that the, the, the opera is being organized around this idea of like, you know. And I think the boxer, if I'm getting the story right, the, the boxer who was called a faggot was actually gay, mm -hmm. but was somewhat closeted so that it became this sort of big event, you know, in terms were, of... Were you a fan of boxing? I mean, no, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, I mean, I was a fan of it because I found the figures fascinating. Right. Um, but I didn't grow up in a household. You know, they were, you know, m my uncles were more like, the game, and the game was not boxing, but the game was like the basketball game, the football right. game, and all these things I had to suffer through when I was a kid. Um, but boxing was not one of them, except that they were interested when there were fights with someone like Ali, they would watch an Ali fight, because Ali, as I said earlier, Ali was bigger than yeah, the sport. He transcended the sport, and so anything he did was of particular fascination to them, even though they weren't boxing fans as such. And did you come back to boxing as a metaphor at all in other works? I'm sure I did. I mean, the Me We Neon that's mm -hmm. at the Studio Museum is a. Um, the story is that Ali gave a speech at Harvard, I think in 75, 
And after this speech, someone in the audience said, give us a poem, because Ali was famous for these <laughs> poems that he would just recite. And he said, me, we. Well, that was the poem. And, um, and I was fascinated by it, because as I said, Ali is deeply interested in the fate of black people. So the connection, you know, and also it's a bit of a palindrome, the way I've mm -hmm. organized it in the neon. Uh, the, the, the me flipped over is the we, you know, or the other way around. Um, so the idea that, uh, you know, Ali's words, uh, as well as his physical presence and his boxing career and all of that, uh, was as important to me as his, you know, the sure. fight, sure. I think. Yeah. So I wanted to come back just to start a little bit about your early life and becoming an artist. Can you tell us a little bit about just growing up and your experiences? Were you exposed to art? You know, you have all this text. Were you like a voracious reader? You know, you, you know what, what, what was your early, early childhood like? Uh, let's see, early childhood. I grew up in the South Bronx. Um, I miss the beginnings of hip hop um, because my mother was like, this is like, we go downstairs with those hoodlums scratching up those records, you know? <laughs> so perfectly good records. So why are they scratching them up? So I missed it. I heard it. I missed it. Um, was, um, went to a very liberal school called Walden. Some, some of you might know that in Manhattan. Um, that had kids like, you know, Mike D from the Beastie Boys went there and Matthew Broderick and stuff and Billy D. Williams would come in for parent-teacher conference and things like that. So that was my upbringing, going from the Bronx to the school. Um, I was remembering one of the first times I was in the Hamptons, I used to be a, a sort of counselor, administrative assistant at this social service agency called Boys Harbor and they owned camp they had property, probably still do have this property on Three Mile Harbor. Uh, and I remember going there, and I, I think the kids themselves were probably 14, 15, and I was a bit older. And they decided we needed a movie night. So we went, I'm pretty sure it was this theater in Sag Harbor. Um, we went to movie night, and movie night was uh, Cassavetes' film, Women Under the Influence. <laughs> which none of the other kids got at all, and I was totally traumatized by this. Like, as a 18-year-old, I was like, I know what this movie is about. This is totally scary, but 13-year-olds that went over their head. Um, so, yeah, but my mom, you know, uh, she was encouraging in some ways of me learning about art, because that's what a good citizen should know. She should know about everything. Right. But her famous line, which I've said before in other talks, is like, the only artist I've ever heard of is dead. And what she meant was Picasso, Matisse, you know, who were, in fact, at that time, dead. So, but, so it just wasn't in her experience. But, you know, she sent me to after-school drawing classes at the Metropolitan Museum, which was across the park from uh, this high school of elementary school, high school I went to, Walden. She sent me to pottery classes in Greenwich Village. And then, so thinking about it later on, I was like, well, why did you send me to these things if, and I think it's just that she, there was no model for her of someone being an artist, but she knew that if something was important to me, she should support it. And so that was, and this is, you know, mom raising two, two kids on her own, uh, separated from my dad. My dad was still around, but separated from them. So just sort of the idea of like, whatever, whatever educational thing should be prioritized. You know, so any book I wanted to buy, fine. $100 sneakers, no way. Did you like reading like classics and literature? I liked reading because I hated going outside to play. Mm -hmm. So um, reading was the way that I could say that I needed to stay inside mm -hmm. because ugh, this is way too much information. But <laughs> you know how like maybe this doesn't happen anymore. It's almost like child abuse. You, you know, your parents would say, go outside and play. <laughs> uh, you have to go out for an hour. You've been in the house all day. Go outside and play. You know, it's like, so I would, 
we lived in a high-rise building, and I would go down to where the maintenance guys were in the basement, and they had a time clock, and I would sit in front of that time clock for exactly one hour. And is that because you didn't want to pl play meaning like sports? Like you weren't into Bronx sports? in the 60s was dangerous. <laughs> so it was really a cr you were worried about your safety. I was worried about my safety. My brother didn't have these problems. Right. He would be out all day. But that, that just not, was not who I was. So books became this kind of refuge for me. Got you know, uh, And it seemed, my mother didn't quite buy it. It just seemed, and I used to have, I'm remembering now, I used to have a gym class in school. I would have a he headache every day at two o'clock when gym class. <laughs> and my gym teacher was like, well, I don't know. I don't really have these headaches every day. I was like, yeah, isn't it funny? Every day at two o'clock, <laughs> I get a headache and I just can't go to gym. And so, do you, so they sent me to the library. And do you recall, like, when did it occur to you that you actually, I could be an artist? I, I really can pursue this as a career. Uh, I think it occurred to me sometime in the mid-80s when I got a grant for $5,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts and I, for drawing. And I realized, like, oh, the government thinks I'm an artist. So I guess I'm an artist now. Because up until that, I was, you know, proofreader at a law firm. That's what I told my parents. So the like, jobs you had before you kind of supported yourself with art, where you were a, yeah, a but law firm? In, yeah, but it was just kind of like, you know, back in the day working at Skadden Arps, the law that, firm. That's a, that's a pretty you serious kind of, first job. Well, I, you know, support staff. This was back when... Oh, you worked there? Oh, yeah. Well, I probably saw you around the office. Because <laughs> uh, they... Well, I won't, well, I won't make the joke I was going to make. But... Um, no, Scan was interesting because you could freelance, so you could work there 30 hours a week, you could work there 80 hours a week, so it was a great job at that moment for artists because you could work as much as, or as little as you wanted and still have a job. Right. Um, and it was at the moment when there were all these corporate mergers, so they would send us up to Armonk to, you know, Xerox things all night long, you know, wow. for... $12 an hour it's at, back in the day was a fortune. So, so it was a kind of easy job. And I met a lot of artist friends. They're actually friends still to this day that I met proofreading in the middle of the night at this law and firm. And I guess you were going to museums too, right? I mean, I read that you were very interested in abstract expressionism. That was kind of the, the first thing that you kind of got into. Well, it was some kind of very narrow notion of what art is, you know. Uh, art looked like painting to me, and it looked like abstract expressionist painting. So I would go and look at, you know, de Kooning's, Pollock's, that's who I was looking at. Um, and there was actually this, uh, I think I was in college. I used to go, there was this Kooning, de Kooning painting called Pirate. It was at the Museum of Modern Art. And I would go to visit it every three months. And I would stand in front of the painting and just staring at it. And I loved de Kooning's work, but that painting in particular. And uh, this funny thing would happen where it would start to get brighter. The more I stood in front of it, the more it sort of got brighter and seemed to glow. And I took this as, you know, I'm getting the artist's meaning, that it's being transmitted to me. Like I stand in front of this painting and its meaning gets transmitted. And then when I was in college, um, one day I was with, my brother was driving, I never learned to drive, which is why I don't come to Hamptons. Um, but my brother was driving me to school, I went to school at Wesley in Connecticut, and we are on the highway, and maybe it was raining, and he was like, you need to watch for the exit signs, and I couldn't see them, and he's like, you need glasses. And I realized, like, oh, maybe I do need glasses, but I, nobody had ever told me I needed glasses. So I went to an optometrist, and it's like, yes, you need glasses. And got a pair oh, of glasses. Hold on, you didn't think you needed glasses? You, didn't, no. you needed somebody else to tell you? you no, you this was the 70s. <laughs> you know, people like went to a private school in the 70s. <laughs> Maybe the books had really big... <laughs> Free big to be print. you and me. We went on civil rights marches, but nobody told me that, like... You get headaches every day because you can't see the board because you're straining your eyes because you need glasses. At 2 o'clock. Yeah, at 2 <laughs> o'clock all day long. Uh, and whenever I wore sunglasses, I would get headaches. And I just thought, well, maybe it's just like I don't look good in sunglasses, so my eyes are telling me to take this. Anyway, 
Um, so what was the point of the story? Anyway, the de Kooning painting, which get into focus and, you know, blah, 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 showing its meaning to me as I stood in front of it. So I got glasses, and I remember very distinctly walking. It was in New York. I walked out of the, the shop where I got the glasses with my new prescription and put them on for the first time. I was outside. I thought, oh, this is what it's like to actually see things. And then I said, New York is the ugliest, dirtiest city I've ever seen. Him. I had never actually seen it, really. And then when I went back to the modern, I realized that thing that used to happen with that painting didn't happen. And what it was was my eyes wander. So it would take me a minute or two or three to focus on what's in front of me. So what I took as like, the painting transmitting its meaning directly to me was just simply like, your eyes wander and you don't focus. But with glasses, that's all. You can just see what's there, you know? I mean, I still love the painting, but so when there's you... some disillusion. That was my primal seeing with art, this right. kind of disillusionment about like, oh, it's not just this personal one-to-one -one transmission of meaning from there's stuff to know, stuff to think right. about, stuff to learn. You and know. in those early days in your studio, did you start experimenting with more abstract expressionist Dick? Well, that's what I was doing. I was yeah. fourth generation abstract expressionist. Um, had, had you no, when you first started, had you even been aware of the African American abstract expressionists that had been there that were not at MoMA at that nobody time? Nobody was teaching this in no. school. Not so you once. had no idea. Nobody. No. No. I mean, I had great teachers at Wesleyan, uh, both painting teachers, Jacqueline Garavage. Uh, our historians, but it just was not, you know, this was like late 70s, early 80s, but African-American art just did not come up. Right. Like, so I had to find it on my own. And again, too much information, but I had an amazing professor there, uh, Robert O'Mealy, he taught African-American literature at Wesleyan. He invited me to go to a lecture for Omari Bearden at Yale. And, uh, and this must have been 1980, 81. So we get to this big lecture hall at Yale, um, and I'm waiting for Bearden to come out, and I don't see him, don't see him, it's late, people are, you know, where, where is he, where is he? Then someone comes out, and he's adjusting the microphone, and I was like, where's Bearden? And then the someone who came out to adjust the microphone starts speaking, and I thought, <laughs> oh, this is so weird that I've come to see an African-American painter talk about his work, but when they appear on stage, I have so little concept of what an African-American artist looks like or could be that I don't recognize him. So that was a profound moment where I realized, like, I really have missed out and I have to educate myself. So that's the moment when I started looking more closely at Alma Thomas, Beard in later Jack Whitten, Ed Clark, you know, all these people who I should have known about, you know, but didn't know anything about because they just weren't being taught in schools. And I think that's changed now. Um, but again, this, this is, it. at that moment, yeah. they weren't a regular part of the curriculum. And so these early works where you were playing around with abstract expressionism, there was one moment where you put in some of your own text that you wrote, right? You hand wrote some text on some early works? Oh, no, it wasn't my text. It was always quotation. But, but I'm just yeah, saying you yeah. hand wrote it as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, hand wrote it. Yeah, hand wrote it. And it was a way to, you know, in a way, some of my practice is very literal in some ways. Like, I want to get these ideas into my paintings. How do I do that? Well, take the ideas from the books I'm reading and make the paintings out of them. So that's how that came about. Now, it took you know, years to figure that out. And there were certainly models for like text and art, you know, so I was looking at the painters who did it, you know, Rauschenberg, Johns, Twombly, et cetera, but also looking at Barbara Kruger, Martha Rosler, those kinds of people. So there were certainly models for text and art. It's just not something I thought I could do because I was committed to a certain kind of painting that seemed antithetical to the idea of this text. But then I figured out a way to make the paintings out of the text. You know? And when you did those early works, when you were handwriting the text, that kind of has left, right? Have you ever come back to handwrite something? 
Well, handwriting reads as, first of all, my handwriting's not so good, but <laughs> hand, you know, I'm not like Cy Twombly handwriting, you know, mm -hmm. I have Glenn Ligon handwriting, <laughs> I don't have Cy Twombly handwriting, so my handwriting is not this elegant, old, worldy, timey, you know, can't make paintings out of that, my handwriting. Um, but I also realized that handwriting is personal and the texts were always quotations, so I wanted, I started using stencils because it seems sort of impersonal, you know, anybody can use a stencil. So it was a way of distancing myself from the text in certain ways, uh, even though a lot of the early texts I was using had the word I in it, you know, I feel most colored when thrown against a sharp white background, which is a quote from a Zora Neale Hurston essay. So they had this autobiographical sense in them, but because they were stenciled and because they were often single sentences repeated, there was a kind of distancing that was important yeah. to me through that and process so of how they're what made. What year was stenciled. the first text piece that you stenciled? Roughly. Mm, 1990, 89. Oh, no, like because that. I am a man. It was, oh, but you didn't stencil that's that, not right? a Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. All right, yeah. so I am a man, 88, 1988. You're one of your most important works. Um, it was, you know, based on signs carried by striking sanitation workers in Memphis in 68. It's the march that Martin Luther King came to support when he was assassinated. And I believe I saw uh, one of these signs that uh, black sanitation workers were carrying that said, I am a man. Um, and the strike was about, you know, the strike for equal pay, better working conditions, um, and so I saw this sign in various, you know, I think actually, no, I'm, I'm getting the story wrong. I saw the sign first in Charles Rangel's office uh, in Harlem. Uh, and uh, it was like a you know, school visit or something. And there's this sign in a frame poster. And I knew nothing about the history of the was march. Was it an actual one of the Yeah, it was one of the actual signs, yeah. yeah. Knew nothing about the history of the march. I just saw it. Why is it in this politician's office? And then it stuck with me, as most of the things that I use in my work, if it sticks with me for a couple of years or longer, then I try to make something out of it. Because it's obviously, if it's stuck with me all this time, it must be important. So it stuck with me because I saw, you know, I went to visit Charles Rankle's office. Maybe I was in high school, maybe. So that painting was from 1989. So that was a good 20 years later or whatever. Um, and it was the, you know, it was an important painting because it set up a lot of things that I would do in my work. It was a painting that was based on a text that wasn't mine. It was a painting that was based on thinking about a particular moment in our cultural history or political history, uh, black and white, a painting rather than some other kind of way of presenting text. So that was a very important painting for me. But that painting was made with oil paint and enamel paint, and it was cracking and falling apart. And so and hand painted those legs. Hand painted them. Yep. Um, and the painting itself, you know, over time started cracking. And so I, I, many years after I made the painting, I asked a conservator, a painting conservator, I know, to do a condition report on that painting, to, which is what you would do to sort of address all the things that need to be conserved if the painting were coming into a museum. And then I made a set of prints out of that as a which way to think really about. Which is a really beautiful work, yeah. Yeah, as a way to think about, you know, how our ideas around history and civil rights movement, masculinity changed over time, that all of these ideas are always in process and in flux. And, and that painting could not be more appropriately now, is owned by the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Did you hold on to that work for 24 years? And Because I know they bought it in 2012. Yes, uh, I hung on to it because, again, I, I say this to young artists and they don't always believe me, but the smart ones do, that you have to save work that's generative of new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, because just because you can sell something for $5 doesn't mean you should, you know? So you're saying keep it more because it will help you generate more ideas, not necessarily save it because it's like a 401k plan or be worth more down the road? Well, 
that too. <laughs> that too. But more importantly, I think if if something for me they're key works, and sometimes I think you have to hang on to those things because and key works for me is not necessarily the best work, quote mm -hmm. unquote, mm -hmm. but the work that generates the most ideas that you can look at again and again and think of like, oh, this is the direction I could go, this is the direction I could go. So I always tell young artists, like, don't just give everything away, mm. you know, just keep stuff. And one of those, that was reinforced because I saw a Jasper Johns show at a gallery in New York, and they just went around the room and it's like, courtesy of the artist, courtesy of the artist, courtesy of the artist. Yeah. Like, oh, he's kept all this stuff, yeah. you know? And they I mean, were that, amazing things. That, that generation, that, I mean, Cy Twombly, Jasper, Ellsworth, they all kept so much of their work. Well, it's amazing to keep things when you have no money, yeah. you know? It's not like these artists were selling for the prices they were selling now. They mm. kept work when they were, you know, living in the cold water loft yeah. and yeah. the South Street Seaport, you know? So, I, so I tell artists that, you know, be be protective of the things that generate ideas for you in the yeah. studio. So, so I am a man is a quintessential work. There's black and white, black black and white lettering, crystal clear, easy to read. You made a bunch of other text works very similarly, but then kind of quickly you started moving into text works that get really hard to read. And so you kind of have this like I should be able to read it. It's a reference, but I can't read it kind of concept, which is, is kind of confounding. Do you, do you want people to kind of Google to look up the text to read it separately, to struggle through trying to figure it out? I mean, what, 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 what's the, the guidance on how you think that work should be interpreted? Well, I, you know, I seem to be full of stories today. Um, that's I did why a we're lecture. here. That's why, <laughs> yeah, we're, that's here. why we're here. Yeah, I did Look, a lecture it's, it's at the It's a sellout crowd. They're here for the stories. Okay. Um, <laughs> I did a lecture once, I think it was at the Whitney, and I showed a painting that had, maybe it was the I Feel Most Colored painting, you know. And it has a clear text on the bottom. It's a stenciled painting. It's the size of a door. Clear text at the bottom, and it kind of, that text repeats over and over, that sentence repeats over and over again, and it gets all, you know, painterly at the bottom as the paint accumulates on the stencil. It's sort of the, the text disappear. And someone in the audience got up and said, well, I don't understand, you know, I, you know, when I look at a de Kooning, another, that's the connection here, to look at a de Kooning, I know what I'm looking at, but when I'm looking at your painting, I don't really understand, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing or what I'm supposed to be looking at. And I had to say, hmm, there's a sentence at the top of that painting. It says, I feel most color when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Did you read that? <laughs> Okay, that sentence repeats. So at the bottom there, it's the same sentence. But I realized like there is a kind of, this is a moment where I felt like black artists have to explain themselves over and over and over again. And so even when the work is super clear, I don't get it, I don't see it, I don't, I don't know, you know, totally incomprehensible to this person. It's like, there's a sentence, and then I repeat it. That's it. Um, but, what was also interesting when he's talking about de Kooning, I realized, oh, this is almost like knowledge that's like, it's naturalized. When I look at a de Kooning, I know what I'm looking at. I was like, I don't, it took me years, you know, to figure out what these paintings were about. So you've forgotten that you've learned how to look at a de Kooning. And what I'm asking you is learn to read art, you know? Like, I got text in my painting, so you have to learn how to read my painting too. Mm -hmm do the same work you did with the de Kooning that you forgot about, you know? But what you're telling me in that situation is, I don't want to do that work. And so in some ways, I think my paintings have gotten more abstract because I've made that work harder to do. But as you said, you know, when people talk about like, oh, your text is so hard to read, I just, you know? Five seconds, you're on your phone all day long, just <laughs> do that, you right, know? Right. And you will find out where that text is from. Um, so, so in a way, the internet has made my, you know, made the text more accessible. But also, I would say, that the difficulty of the text in my paintings is not difficulty for difficult difficulty's sake. It's about the ideas that are in the text. James Baldwin, writing this essay, Stranger in the Village, 1953. 
He's talking about his encounters with these villagers in the Swiss village he's living in, for many of whom, the first black person they've ever seen. And so there's this kind of fascination with his skin color, his hair, where is he from? No, Americans are white. Black people aren't from America, they're from Africa. You must be from Africa. There's a statue in the church with a little black figurine on it because it's a missionary society, you know, missionary church. And so he's dealing with this sense of like, what does it mean to be an other and outsider in that context? What's his relationship to European culture? What's Europe's relationship to its colonies in Africa? This is the 50s. You know, he's thinking about all of these things in the space of a 12-page essay. Those are difficult, hard ideas to deal with. And so I want the paintings themselves to present that level of difficulty in the reading. And you've cited a lot of different sources of text and authors, but that one essay you've used for 25 years. So that one really is at the core. Well, of, of it keeps being relevant. It keeps kind of circulating through. I mean, Baldwin is everywhere now, post, you know, the movie Raul Peck's documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, but he is everywhere, you know. Um, but there was a moment when his work has gone out of favor, you know. Um, and so I'm interested, I think, always in, particularly around African American authors, if you think about Zora Neale Hurston, you know, writer of the Harlem Renaissance, books out of print, uh, buried in an unmarked grave. Alice uh, Walker has to go f literally find her grave, you know. Books come back into print. Uh, one of the first paintings I made was in this, uh, that series I keep talking about, you know, I Feel Most Colored, that uses Zora Neale Hurston's text. Uh, they were in a little show in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, Upstairs was the work of a playwright I didn't know, but got to met in the run of this show because it was a theater upstairs gallery space downstairs. The person upstairs having the play was Susan Laurie Parks. The little show that I had, I thought, hmm, nobody's going to come to this. In walks George Wolfe, the director, who's there to see Susan Laurie Parks' play. And at that moment, when he sees my Zora Neale Hurston paintings, he is producing on Broadway adaptations of her short stories. So he buys the painting off the wall. So I feel like there's some weird serendipity in that. But it's interesting to me that a figure like Hurston that seems so important and present, her books are out of print. You can find them, you know. So there's... And Baldwin, too, I feel like, yes, we always think of Baldwin as always present, but that's not the case. And so this sort of in and out of favor cycle visibility of these cultural, particularly black cultural producers, is something I'm interested in. And one more story about that, Whitney program, 1984, little tiny studios that you shared with another person reading psychoanalytic theory and four-part lectures on it, on Lacan and, you know, Foucault and all this stuff. So I was talking to the person that shared my studio, and I was saying, like, oh, this reading is so hard. I don't have the background for this. It's like, oh, yeah, I studied all this in college. It's, like, very basic. And I was saying, oh, well, I'm reading James Baldwin as a sort of palate cleanser in between <laughs> slogging through my Lacan. And she's like, James Baldwin, who's that? And it wasn't that she had never read James Baldwin. She didn't know the name, you know? And I thought, oh, you know Lacan. <laughs> you know Foucault, you know? But you never even heard James Baldwin's name. So that's where James Baldwin was at that moment, you know? in certain parts of the culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the text works ultimately lead to neon and, and, and neon text works. Wh where did you first even have that idea to use neon? Uh, because I made a joke with a neon fabricator. Yeah. <laughs> no, literally. You know, the studio building I was in in Brooklyn had a neon fabricator at the bottom, and I don't make neon, so I just walked by for years. And he was a friendly guy. His name is Matt Dilling. He still has an amazing shop. 
in Kingston, New York, does neon for any artist you can name. Matt's done projects with him. Um, but I've walked by his shop for years because I make neon. And then one day he invited me in. And he knew you were an artist. Yeah, he knew I was an artist. Uh, and he gave, offered to give me a tour. We walked around the shop. And he was showing me like the Joseph Kasu pieces he was working on or, you know, all this stuff. And then just as a joke, I said, well, Matt, I make, you know, black and white text paintings, so what about black neon? And he sort of thought for a moment and said, black is the absence of light. And I thought, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so there is no black neon. He's like, well, actually, and then he showed me a project he'd done for, because he did commercial work, he showed me a sign he'd done for Burberry's. And, and he had to reproduce Burberry's plaid in a neon in a window. And he said, you know, the Burberry's plaid has a black stripe. You know, it's like, I forgot what the colors are, but you know, part of the plaid is a black stripe. And he said the way he reproduced the black stripe was just paint a white neon to black on the front. So it read as neon, but it also read as a black line as part of the stripe. And the minute he said that, I was like, bet, you know, let's sail this ship. And so the first neon was um, Negro Sunshine. Which is a Gertrude Stein reference, which is... A Gertrude Stein reference. And, and had you been reading Gertrude Stein? I just saw that Oh, Gertrude quote. Stein, yeah. But Gert everybody has to read Gertrude Stein in college. But Gertrude Stein is like, oh, you know, particularly the books... Three Lies that has a whole section on these black characters and it's brutal reading. I mean, it's just the most brutal depictions of black people and I'll, but, just, I'll just read the one sentence. Mm -hmm. Quote, Rose laughed when she was happy but she had not the wide abandoned laughter that makes the warm brood glow of Negro sunshine. Yeah. Rose was never joyous with the earth-born, boundless joy of Negroes. Yeah, it goes on from there. <laughs> um, but I think that in a text like that, I focused on the words Negro sunshine, which obviously is a joke, you know. It's for, for Stein, it's a kind of like blackness and sunshine are oppositions, you know. Blackness as people and sunshine as light, you know, they are oppositions. But I thought, oh, that's so... It's a great phrase, though, and often, um, uh, this is a total tangent, but uh, this poet, Nicole Seeley, has just put out a book that is a poem that is a report, a, I think a government report about the uprisings in Ferguson, and she's made a poem out of kind of redacting that text, and I thought, it's such a beautiful idea of like, in the wake of a kind of tragedy, we make poems. That's black life in America. And so in the wake of this like, Stein text, which is very problematic description, stereotypical problematic descriptions of black interiority, there's this one phrase, Negro sunshine, that I pluck out and put on a wall, and it takes on this whole other meaning. So I think, the best work for me, I'm not even saying the best work I've made, <laughs> but the best work for me is work that transforms something like that into something else. Sure. So much so that you can't even remember the thing it was based on. Right. That becomes less important. And, and look, one of your other incredibly important neon works is America, the America piece after Caspar David Friedrich from behind. Wh you talked about using America as a medium. You know, you've kind of created this idea of different, like words as a medium, text as a medium, and America as a medium is a very huge idea that you super successfully used in more, more than once. Well, I think, you know, for me, because I'm not a sculptor in a traditional way, and neon is a way of thinking about things in space, you know, 3D objects, but also thinking about words as material, the way a sculptor would think about clay or wood as a material, and I think, you know, words are there to bend, stretch, again, you know, like, the examples for this are obviously, you know, because I grew up in the South Bronx, graffiti, 
but also, you know, rap and hip hop, you know, the, the bending, transforming, changing the language. And so those are the models for that. But thinking about words as material, so I realized, oh, a, a, a neon is a perfect way to work with words because you can flip it, you can put black paint on the front so it seems eclipsed, you can animate it so it blinks, you know, America blinks off and on annoyingly, you know, um, as it does. Um, so yeah, just using that word, but also America is such a charged word, we think we depending on our political leanings, know what it means, but it's always contested. You know, every generation has to make it and remake it. So it's one of those words that I feel like, as material, is very, you know, loaded and rich and useful, you know. We're running out of time, but I wanted to just get a few words and one of my favorite bodies of work, which is the coloring book works, and. Um, utilizing images of Malcolm X, among others, but it's a fascinating, you know, story about working with kids and kind of how that started in Minneapolis. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about that experience. No, oh, I did a series of paintings based on children's coloring books from the '70s um, that I found in the Schomburg Library in Manhattan, and they were coloring books from late '60s, early '70s, done by black educators with the idea that in the public schools, like the public school I went to across the street from my house, uh, when I was in kindergarten, this is before the private school, and the reason I got to the private school was the kindergarten, it's too long a story, but <laughs> basically my mother came in for a conference when I was in kindergarten with the principal of the school, said, your kid's really smart, you should get him in private school, and my mother was like, mm. We live in the projects across the street, don't have private school money. And then one of my homeroom teachers said to her, your kid might be smart here, but if they were in a real school, they would just be average. Oh. So my mother said, let me find a real school for my child to go to, and then be given up by his kindergarten teachers, kindergarten teachers. Um, so, um, Coloring books, yes. So late 60s, early 70s, black educators feel like there's not enough black history being taught in public schools. And so they create these series of coloring books that have things that any coloring book has, you know, child playing basketball or something like that, next to images of Malcolm X, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, as a way to normalize black figures to primarily black kids. So I found these coloring books and realized like, oh, this is such an interesting moment when there's a political agenda behind these books. But I was invited to do a residency at the Walker Art Center and I said, oh, I want to use these coloring books. I'm going to give them to kids to color in. But there were kids from just in Minneapolis, so there were kids from all over the place, you know. Uh, there's a lot of immigrant uh, communities, uh, in Minneapolis, so all kinds of kids. And I realized also their relationship to this material, you know, because these kids were four, five, six years old, is tangential, you know? Like, is that you, Mr. Glenn? No, that's Malcolm X, you know? Like, so they, so I would say, like, <laughs> Uh, you know, give them a little history lesson, as much as you can give a five-year-old history lesson, and then they did these drawings, and then I made paintings based on these drawings these kids did in the coloring books that I provided them, and then showed the coloring books, they, the drawings they did along with my paintings. And one of them was an image of Malcolm X, this little kid had drawn lipstick and eyeshadow and blush on the cheeks, and I was like, ah, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but, um, I made this painting and you know it's sort of like I realized like oh for a child it's just an image to transgress you know it's like scribbling over the face of the father you know that's what that's about but I bring an adult's knowledge to what Malcolm X is you know what a hero he was and all of those you know associations so even making the painting was difficult for me because I was like oh wow, can I do this? Um, and uh, I did it, I went there. Um, but it's one of my favorite 
paintings in a way, and I don't really make a lot of figurative work, so it was, again, quotation. It's children's drawings turned into paintings by mine. So questions? Should we open yeah, it up? Want some questions? Oh, Sam, there's one. Uh, Rashid probably can hear you, but Sam's got the mic. Hi, uh, big fan. Um, <laughs> long time listener, first time caller kind of situation. <laughs> Uh, thinking a little bit about what you discussed earlier with, with the work upstairs in particular, it was really interesting to, to me because it's something I've been thinking about a lot in, in my own project. But when you made reference to kind of Tupac and the Thug Life piece or, or thinking about Ice Cube's eyes, I wonder how some of these kind of symbols and ideas age for you. Mm. And if in any way, because you also described what we now understand Ice Cube to have become, which is fine for me. I'm yeah, fine with yeah, what he too. is. Um, but how do you feel about how some of these signifiers age and develop? Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel uncomfortable with them? Do you feel joy or shame for having kind of identified certain things in certain ways and then watched them evolve? Um, yeah, interesting question because it is, uh, um, and I think that is always the, when you're using iconography from a certain period that has a certain kind of meaning, you have to be open to the fact that that meaning will shift over time. Um, and that's something I sort of said when the, with the I Am A Man painting, when I did the condition report on it 20 years later, I realized like, oh yeah, my ideas about my motivations for making this painting that said I Am A Man have changed over time. Like I look at this work in different ways. It has different kind of resonance for me. So when I look at the work upstairs, which is almost 30 years old, I realize, um, yeah, the concerns, the, I would say that the, the thing that I would think about now, um, I think I didn't go deep enough in a way, like boxing as a subject matter. It was kind of, you asked me if I'd done work afterwards and I had the me we, but that's Ali as from Ali particularly. But I think I could have gone a bit deeper into like the punching bag as a form. It was just the thing to put some, something on, you know, a recognizable form that speaks to boxing. But I think I could have played with it more. And I did a little bit with that long bag that's sort of slumped in the corner because I realized punching bags are substitute for the body. So I wanted to make something that seemed more body-like than a hanging bag. And so that was that. So I think I could have been more sculptural is maybe what I'm trying to say with that work. Um, but in terms of like what's, that work is the work it is and it has different interpretations now. Um, and maybe like in terms of the commercialization I was talking about, it's probably something I was thinking about then. That's why Ice Cube's eyes end up as a logo because I did feel like there was something about rap and hip hop that was monetizing black male anger. Um, and I felt like it was being commercialized in ways that we weren't always in control of, you know, or the producers of that music weren't always in control of. And definitely like, you know, f the, the, the landscape has changed, you know, Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart need I say more um, but I think the culture can you know there's other people <laughs> making that work now and so if I were making that work now I would look to those other producers probably to think more about particularly the music connection to boxing and boxing culture and even boxing as a sport has changed tremendously over the last 30 years so yeah okay. As a follow-up question, I was curious how you felt about, you know, the commercialization and, you know, um, cultural appropriation is one thing, but I feel that we've kind of moved into a new place where there's like this cancel culture and where there, especially for leaders and other prominent 
figures. It's not just that they're being overly commercialized and kind of transformed into these like commercial products, but that people are actually sort of being canceled, and I see it uh, disproportionately affecting different populations of people. And there are so many things going on right now. I'm curious how you feel about this kind of crossing out or Xing out of people when there's something happens as opposed to following that everything is in process and in flux, as you spoke about, and where you sort of see your work going now, where like the new fight is for you in terms of how you want to, you know, step on to have your voice be heard on this hmm. artistic stage. Uh, well, I think there's a difference between commercialization, because you know, because um, I'm not saying that people's, you know, people have control have and have not control of their own images. And some of the commercialization that I find in music is self-generated, you know. It, I mean, it is a commodity to be sold, you know. Um, so I laugh when Snoop says, like, I don't understand Spotify. I get a million, you know, plays and I got five cents, so I don't get it. So he's right, he should be getting more money off of that stuff. Um, cancel culture is a bit well, I don't know if there is such a thing as cancel culture, but, and probably there are some people that should be canceled. Um, I'm not gonna name no names, but um, yeah. Um, but I think that we all, hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. Maybe I'll go to skip to the where the work is going. No, it's just like having a limited time. You know, it's difficult. It's sort of challenging. Well, I think that, you know, somebody asked me about, and this is a little bit of a tangent, somebody asked me about, I can't even remember who it was, but trying to excuse somebody's racism and saying, well, they were a man of his time. And I was like, you know, Frederick Douglass was a man of his time, too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Harry Tubman was a woman of her time, and Donald Trump is a man of his time, you know. So I don't, I don't have a good answer for you, but I think that people need to be responsible for their actions, and, and if those actions are detrimental, if they hurt people, then they should be called out, you know. Um, that's all, I guess. And in terms of where the work is going, um, you know, I think it's getting more and more abstract. You know, I'm, most of my work has been text-based, and I find recently that I'm interested in text that doesn't have to do with words, that's semic, that doesn't have particular meaning. And so I've been looking at a lot of outsider artists, been thinking about the way that people make things that look like writing, but are not writing, that, or have an interior meaning that's not accessible. So I'm just thinking about that in relationship to abstraction. So that's kind of where the work is going. And maybe, you know, partially that's a reaction to the post-truth world we're in, you know, where um, there are facts and then there are alternative facts, you know, that maybe that started with a reaction to that, where one can't rely on words to mean things in, in the public imagination, or they have no weight in their meaning. So maybe I'm trying to grapple with that as a subject matter, yeah. Sorry, that was a bit garbled answer yeah, that was a to great your question. But. Sorry, that was a great answer, actually. Um, do we have other questions? Oh, great. I just want to say that you accomplished what you wanted through your work. The message is out there for me, certainly. So for me, that's incredibly important. And I'd love to meet your mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Sadly, she's passed away, but she did, um, oh, this is gonna make me cry a little bit. I got to meet Obama once uh, in between. I was with Lorna Simpson, who's here, 
uh, backstage at the Apollo at a fundraiser, uh, I think f when he was running for the second term. And he, he was there uh, with a bunch of aides, and we got kind of snuck in to meet him. And uh, he was being introduced by his I'm not chief of staff or head of the Democratic National Committee, Patrick Gaspard, who said, Mr. Obama, this is Glenn Ligon. Black like me, number two, is in the White House. And he turns to me and says, oh yeah, we have a set of prints too, but they had to rotate them out because the light was too strong. And I missed them and I thought, kill me now. <laughs> kill me now. Kill me now. But then my second thought was, uh, this is the part that's going to make me start crying, was like, I wish my mother was here, because he had just lost his mother not so long ago. So. so that was just a moment where I was like, President of the United States knows there's art in his house and knows when it's not there. That's kind of amazing. And that it's yours. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. It's a wonderful conversation. Thank you.